Thanks for watching the ninth edition of AI Weekly Update from Henry AI Labs. This has been a really exciting week in AI with things like OpenAI's robotic hand solving a Rubik's Cube with their novel automatic domain randomization algorithm, things like Facebook's semi-weekly supervised learning framework, and Google's massive multilingual neural machine translation system. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos. The ninth edition of AI Weekly Update will begin by covering OpenAI's remarkable success of a robotic hand solving a Rubik's Cube. This paper presents a really interesting meta-learning algorithm for bridging the sim to real uh, training distribution gap uh, with a automatic domain randomization algorithm. Then we'll look at Facebook's semi-weekly supervised training framework. This is a really interesting framework for bridging advances in semi-supervised learning with weekly supervised learning. Weekly supervised learning being things like uh, using hashtags from Instagram uh, photos as a label for a supervised learning problem, and then semi-supervised learning being this idea of constructing artificial supervised learning tasks from unlabeled data. Then we'll look at uh, Google's AI blog investigating uh, video architecture search, different architecture searches, uh, techniques for developing efficient networks that can uh, take advantage of spatial and temporal information to do uh, tasks like video classification, action recognition, this kind of thing. Then we'll look at a series of tutorials from TensorFlow, how to get started with machine learning on Arduino, presenting tutorials on things like getting a uh, speech recognition system started on, our, on Arduino, and then things like uh, gesture recognition. From NVIDIA, we'll look at the FDA clearance uh, improvement of the subtle uh, medicals uh, denoising uh, MRI imaging software using a ResNet encoder-decoder architecture. Then we'll look at a federated learning system for medical imaging developed by researchers at NVIDIA and King's College. Then we'll look at a new study from MIT, which is able to reduce the latency for inferring these uh, gesture recognitions to 12.4 uh, milliseconds. We'll look at Facebook's announcement of the research award winners for the computer vision for global challenges competition. Uh, we'll look at a functional reinforcement library for the uh, RLib Policy Builder API, which has been uh, switched to be a functional API. Uh, we'll look at uh, Reagent, a system from Facebook for building reasoning systems, particularly contextual bandits doing things like A-B testing landing pages or uh, you know d different ads and predicting whether the user will click on them. Then we'll look at uh, a, a blog post from Hugging Face, Benchmark and Transformers on PyTorch and TensorFlow. They've now implemented the uh, Transformers library into TensorFlow as well, and they've uh, provided a spreadsheet and the, this blog post with a lot of interesting insights about the inference performance on PyTorch and TensorFlow. Also from Facebook's AI research blog, we'll look at the Octave Convolution, a really interesting way for structuring the intermediate features, the high and low frequency spatial resolutions of features of convolutional neural networks. Then we'll look at MVFST reinforcement learning, a really interesting platform for dealing with delayed actions, particularly important for network congestion and reinforcement learning. From Google's AI blog, we'll also look at a really interesting study on exploring massively multilingual, massive neural machine translation. So these networks are enormous. They're gonna train up to a 50 billion parameter transformer, and they're gonna to try to do neural machine translation between an enormous amount of languages. Also, we're gonna look at the RAPIDS library advances to RAPIDS, the uh, Spark XGBoost algorithm, and the speed up achieved with the uh, RAPIDS uh, stack with things like the CUDA data frames, this kind of thing. Then we'll look at NVIDIA's presentations at TensorFlow World 2019, and we'll conclude with the batch from Andrew Ang at DeepLearning.ai. OpenAI has completely hijacked the AI news media this week with the remarkable success of a robotic hand solving a Rubik's Cube in the real physical world. So this builds on success of a previous algorithm presented, a previous study from OpenAI, this block orientation OpenAI Dactyl. So in this case, the robotic hand is trying to manipulate this block to match a particular configuration, such as having the end facing upwards and then the left-right faces according to some configuration, and it's viewing the uh, block with a separate vision model. So it has the reinforcement learning policy that's controlling the block and moving it around, and then it has a separate uh, vision model that is you know, telling it if it's successfully, uh, or in the Rubik's Cube case, it's giving it the configuration of the current Rubik's Cube, sending that out to a symbolic Rubik's Cube solver system, and then the Rubik's Cube hand uh, manipulates the cube. So in this study as well, they use domain randomization. And domain randomization is this key algorithm in both studies that is helping them bridge the simulation to reality, sim to real gap, where you want to train these models in simulation and then have them generalize into the real physical world. The system works with a pair of neural networks, the vision model and then the uh, policy network controlling the robotic hand. And both of these neural networks use the uh, simulation to reality uh, transfer bridge with the automatic domain randomization algorithm, ADR. So the automatic domain randomization algorithm builds on last year's block reorientation study by using a meta-learning controller to control how the uh, simulated data is randomized. So the core idea behind domain randomization is that you're going to make the data set as diverse as possible and that will help it generalize the real world, opposed to something like, say, making the simulation as realistic as possible. So in the study also, they uh, are able to achieve 
a pretty good solving with the Rubik's Cube, but as they mentioned, they still only get it about 20% of the time for a maximally difficult scramble. In this case, the maximally difficult scramble isn't really, you know, measured based on how difficult it is to solve the Rubik's Cube because it's a separate system. The Rubik's Cube solver is a symbolic Rubik's Cube solver that is disjoint from the robotic hand and the vision model. Really, difficulty is measured by how many rotations of the Rubik's Cube the hand will need to perform. So in the blog post, they go on to detail this idea of automatic domain randomization. So as shown here is an example of a visual randomization. So in the visual world, you can imagine randomizing things like lighting, uh, the magnitude of shadows, and then miscellaneous colors of objects, things like this. And then also in the physics simulator where the robotic hand is learning to uh, you know, rotate the Rubik's Cube, flip it, and do these miscellaneous gestures, you can also uh, randomize different kinds of uh, characteristics of the physics, such as the size and the mass of the Rubik's Cube, as shown in this uh, uh, animation is showing you how in the simulations the Rubik's Cubes get smaller and larger to make the robotic hand more uh, robust to the physical world and the different kinds of uh, situations. The key idea between the Rubik's Cube solver and the block orientation robotic hand from last year is this idea of automatic domain randomization versus a manually encoded curriculum to increase the entropy or the randomness of the diverse data sets. So this algorithm gives rise to really interesting properties like uh, robustness and response to these kinds of perturbations like putting a, ro a rubber glove on the robotic hand, tying fingers together, uh, masking the Rubik's Cube. So masking the Rubik's Cube with the blanket occlusion obviously will have to uh, completely make the vision model render uh, like useless, but it still has this thing called a Gicker Cube where it has these inertial sensors inside the cube, so it's still able to have information about the cube even without the vision model. So also they test with uh, this giraffe pushing the Rubik's Cube to miscellaneous parts of the hand and showing the hand is still able to you know, keep it upright and remain solving the cube. And then the same kind of idea, but just pushing it with a pen. So also interestingly is the emergent meta learning. So the policy network of the agent shown in their uh, research paper has a recurrent layer at the top part of the value and policy networks. And this uh, recurrent layer shown here, sorry, is what gives rise to this emergent meta learning behavior. So it is able to uh, respond to robustness in the training in the simulation because it's experiencing so many diverse data sets. Its, uh, its memory layer is learning how to adjust and relearn the physics if it's the robotic hand controlling the cube or readjust to the visual world if it's the vision model uh, adjusting to different kinds of data augmentations uh, in the simulated environment. So these emergent uh, meta-learning characteristics are things like erasing the network's memory and seeing how quickly it can relearn the dynamics of the environment uh, resetting the dynamics in sense of changing the friction, the mass, or the gravity, and then breaking a finger on the hand or, you know, doing something like tying the fingers together. So they also show uh, visualization analysis, and then they show, and then they describe that there still are some challenges. They haven't completely solved this all the time, but it's a great progress and very visually exciting type of research. In addition to their blog post, OpenAI has also published a 51-page research paper uh, giving further detail about solving the Rubik's Cube with the robotic hand. The first part of the paper shows you about how they have the separate uh, policy network and vision model, and then describing the uh, transfer system to the real world. Uh, the beginning of the paper describes sort of the physical hardware and the construction of the robotic platform, and then later in the paper gets on to the uh, sort of the reinforced learning, the kind of artificial intelligence of the system. So the description of the system starts with the automatic domain randomization, this idea of progressively changing the uh, entropy, the randomness of the sampled environments, and then it goes on to discuss the, you know, see the full algorithm of the automatic domain randomization and then talk about the uh, policy training, how the reward is structured in this case, and then how the uh, policy networks see their exact architecture, how they have the uh, inputs, the embeddings, and then they have this recurrent layer in the uh, actor critic sort of network architecture. And then you can see things like the exact details of the input to the system. Uh, you can see their distributed training system and using their uh, rapid distributed training framework, not the same as rapids from NVIDIA is a different idea. And then you can see their state estimation from vision. And then overall, the paper just gives more details about the, the results, the performance. Uh, interestingly, is this table uh, reporting the success rate of the different models. And also interestingly is just that these models are trained for an absolutely enormous amount of time. OpenAI has also published a lot of videos on YouTube. If you want to watch more about the Rubik's Cube solver, you can see the uncut version of it uh, solving the hand. You can also see the response to perturbations like the rubber glove on the robot, the uh, tied fingers together, the blanket occlusion, 
and you can see like the plush graph pushing plush giraffe uh, pushing the Rubik's cube into different parts of the hand, and the uh, putting the Expo marker to push the Rubik's cube as well. So a lot of interesting visualizations. Reacting to this research, I published an article called The Rise of Meta Learning, in which case I think something that's really interesting about this study of using the Meta Learning Controller for the automatic domain randomization is the analogy with this POET algorithm, which won the best paper at the Gecko uh, Genetic and Evolutionary Computing Conference, and a really interesting study where in the POET environment, there's this bipedal walking agent, and there, it's a population-based training. So there's a population of agents, and then there's a population of different environments. So the environment sort of evolved with the agents in the sense of the agent has sort of an access to uh, like develop its own curriculum, its own like progression of training samples that it uses to learn. So this is similar to the automatic domain randomization in the Rubik's Cube, how it has this progression of simulated uh, diversity to uh, you know progressively level up the robot and find the exact like path to learning something, which I think is a really interesting component of learning. And I'd appreciate it if you checked out the article and let me know what you think about this. Google's AI blog has posted a really interesting study about exploring massively multilingual, massive neural ma machine translation. We're talking about uh, massive neural networks in the end of the study. Transformers like the NVIDIA project Megatron that are really enormous. In the case of Google's AI, they use this G-pipe uh, model parallelism, data parallelism scheme in order to scale up neural networks to this size. So in the study, they're looking at trying to have these machine translation systems that can translate between tons of different languages compared to the bilingual baselines. So a bilingual baseline would be a model that's say trained just to go from English to German or you know German to English. Whereas these models can go through uh, tons of different languages. So what they do is they show that when they are adding tons of different languages, they are in the high resource languages, meaning the languages that they have a lot of training data for, they're not able to outperform the bilingual baseline. But then on the low resource languages, they're able to perform much better than the bilingual baseline. So it's definitely really interesting to see this sort of uh, information sharing between the high resource and the low resource languages and just the, generally the idea of having one model that's able to do it is really remarkable. So what they show also is these clusters where uh, they're having similar representations for similar languages which I also thought was really interesting. But then here's a, uh, probably the meat of the article is that they're showing that they're achieving much better performance as they scale up these transformers using the uh, G-pipe uh, parallelism technique. So you see up top with the green model uh, you know, the bigger the model, the better the performance it seems. When they achieve up to uh, 50 billion parameters with the G-Pipe training scheme, they achieve the best result by far. So definitely a really interesting research study, this idea of uh, multilingual, massive multilingual neural networks. Google's AI blog published a really interesting article detailing some of their research around video architecture search. So neural architecture search is this idea of defining some kind of search space for a neural network architecture and then deploying some kind of search algorithm to search for the optimal configuration of connections between nodes and operations to achieve some kind of performance metric, usually accuracy. So they present three different networks and that they've been studying the Evanet, AssembleNet, and the tiny video net. So the Evanet is this idea of using things like a 3D convolution or the shortcutted 2 plus 1 uh, D ResNet, which is sort of like this idea of, of like a one by one separable convolution, sort of like you can break up the computation of a 3D convolution by doing a two dimensional convolution followed by a one by one convolution. So the idea behind a 3D convolution is that you're teaching, you're treating the temporal scale as like another dimension similar to the height width. So like a 3D convolution would do the same kind of uh, like three by three by three filter convolution that you're familiar with by a three by three uh, two dimensional convolution, but using the time axis as like another, uh, you know, dimension of the tensor. So in this case, the Evanet, they're searching for different ways to configure different kinds of convolutions that operate in this kind of uh, spatio temporal uh, convolutional layer. So they find these different architectures achieving uh, you know, pretty good performance. Then in AssembleNet is a different kind of paradigm, this two stream model where you have the input frames and then you also have the optical flow. So you have the raw input frames, the RGB frames, and the flow is sort of like the change in frame to frame. So they present these different architecture searches that they're using to automatically learn how to fuse optical flow information with the raw frame data. So then the tiny net video networks the idea here is that you're incorporating the computational efficiency of the network into the loss function. So neural architecture search is searching for the optimal architectures that satisfy, satisfy some kind of uh, metric, usually just uh, classification accuracy or you know latency, something like this. So in this case, they're looking at reducing the storage cost, also things like uh, you know uh, latency as well, and achieving like a faster 
uh, millisecond-based inference time. Facebook has published a really interesting framework unifying semi-supervised learning where we have this idea of constructing a supervised signal from an unlabeled data set and this idea of weak supervision where you would do things like use weakly uh, labeled data such as like hashtags on Instagram images in order to train classifiers. So the way that they unify these frameworks together are really interesting using concepts like uh, teacher-student networks and model distillation as well. So the semi-supervised training framework they present is where you have this labeled data set and you use it to uh, train the teacher and then it predicts the labels on the unlabeled data. And so the teacher model predicts the distribution of class scores on the unlabeled data, sort of like model distillation, knowledge distillation, the ideas behind like distill, BERT, and things like this. And it uses this distribution over the prediction on the unlabeled data to pre-train the target student to the student model, and then you fine-tune the student model with the labeled data set. A really interesting approach to semi-supervised training. I've never seen this kind of approach. It's really interesting. So now the idea is to combine semi-weak supervision into this framework. So now the idea is you uh, pre-train the teacher with this weekly supervised data set, something like, say, uh, the labels are hashtags on Instagram images, and then you would fine-tune the teacher, and then the teacher will go back to the weekly supervised data set, do the same idea of predicting the distribution of the class labels, and then use this to pre-train the student network, and then fine-tune it with the labeled data set. So a really interesting framework. They show a lot of really great uh, performance improvements uh, using this framework compared to the fully supervised learning, weekly supervised, outperforming both of these on the ImageNet image classification tasks with the ResNet 50, and they also show uh, a really great performance improvement on video classification with this uh, kinetics data set using the uh, ResNet 2 plus 1D model. TensorFlow's blog has released an interesting series of tutorials about how to get started with machine learning with TensorFlow on Arduino. You can also check out uh, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, talking more about uh, you know what microcontrollers are, the idea of running a speech keyword detection model with just 22 kilobytes. And so what this tutorial is, is first it takes you through uh, getting a neural network on an Arduino board to recognize uh, voice commands like yes, no, and then you go through a more advanced uh, gesture classification model using the uh, TensorFlow Lite to deploy the models on Arduino. So you can check out the tutorials also on GitHub, Arduino TensorFlow Lite tutorials. One of the interesting developments with TensorFlow 2.0 is that Hugging Face's Transformers library is now implemented in TensorFlow 2 as well, so you can access this library from PyTorch and TensorFlow. So in this blog post from Hugging Face, they're benchmarking their Transformers library on PyTorch and TensorFlow. So they link to a spreadsheet where you can see the performance comparisons based on the batch size and the maximum uh, sequence length different models like XLM, Transformer XL, uh, GPT-2, and you can see the benchmarking of PyTorch versus TensorFlow. So the summary that they present in their blog post is that uh, they get a significant uh, inference speed up on PyTorch with the CPUs of uh, 0.748 seconds compared to 0.823, and then on the GPUs, the TensorFlow has, a, it has an advantage, but a very, very slight uh, speed up, so really the same kind of inference time on PyTorch and TensorFlow. Facebook's AI blog is also announcing the open sourcing of MVFSTRL, a research platform for managing network congestion reinforcement learning. So what I thought was really interesting about this uh, study presented in the research paper in the title is that this idea of having reinforcement learning, learning frameworks with delayed action. So contrastingly to something like OpenAI Gym or like these kinds of game environments for reinforcement learning agents, you can kind of like pause the world and then put your action in and then kind of resume the world. Whereas with things like managing network con uh, congestion, you've got this real-time interaction system. So it's definitely a really interesting uh, asynchronous reinforced learning agent, congestion control, handling delayed actions. I think this idea of delayed actions is definitely really interesting and worth looking into further. Facebook's AI blog has announced some of the winners for their Computer Vision for Global Challenges uh, Research Award winners. So you can set, check out some of these research awards from Facebook. You can go to the Research Awards and see the Open Research Awards. Uh, right now you have Systems for Machine Learning and some of the closed ones that have recently happened that we've been covering uh, in these weekly updates. So in the Computer Vision for Global Challenges, they received over 300 applicants, and they give you these three examples of accepted awards. The first one, a computer vision uh, crop disease, uh, plant pest detection system, and the other two being around uh, detection of malaria from blood smears. Facebook's AI block is announcing the open sourcing of Reagent, a modular end-to-end -end platform for building reasoning systems. So this is a reinforcing la uh, learning platform. It seems mostly uh, developed for contextual bandits, Kind of the case of if you're, say, A-B testing website uh, landing page and you have different users and you're kind of showing them different, uh, th you know, the different landing page designs you might have come up with and you're sort of using this as your bandit problem. So this uh, platform reagent, you can see uh, it's sort of a, you know, a system for the deployment, 
uh, training of these kind of systems. And then you can go on their uh, documentation page if you want to install it and then see a basic example of getting started. Facebook's AI research blog also presented Octave Convolutions, a flexible, efficient alternative to standard convolution. So I think this idea is best represented in this image on their research paper. You see how they're kind of dividing the high and low frequency spatial resolution of the intermediate uh, you know, feature maps in the convolutional neural network. So it's definitely a really interesting idea. It's not something I'm super uh, familiar with but it's going to be presented soon at the ICCV 2019 conference. And, you know, definitely they present uh, interesting results as many of these papers with some kind of new technique always kind of give you, you know, some kind of advantage in their technique, but definitely an interesting idea to think about how exactly you're structuring the intermediate features of convolutional neural networks. Researchers at NVIDIA and King's College have presented a really interesting use of federated learning for medical imaging. So their video gives a really nice overview of what federated learning is. You have this centralized model, you distribute the model to the local databases, and then you update the model with these uh, local data sets, and then you send the model back to the centralized server. And it sort of gives you this ability to train locally. You don't have to have a central repository of all this medical sensitive medical image data, of which you know you need a lot of privacy. And so in the article, they also discuss things like the differentiable privacy framework. They link to this book, uh, the algorithm, uh, Algorithmic Foundations of Differential Privacy, if you're interested in learning more about uh, this kind of system. So overall, really interesting, definitely something that will empower more of this uh, medical imaging research, you know, healthcare AI, all this kind of stuff will be enabled and empowered with this federated learning system. A new video processing gesture recognition model developed at MIT is able to achieve a remarkable latency as quoted in the paper of 12.4 milliseconds of latency to predict these gestures. So shown in the GitHub repository, these gestures include things like, uh, you know, hand gestures and that the camera, the embedded system is recognizing. So you can see the, ex uh, the exact architecture in their paper, temporal shift module for efficient video understanding, and they're training their model in this data set, the 20 billion something something data set. This is my first time learning about this data set. It's a really cool data set. They have, uh, it's kind of like they give it this really specific sort of text prompt to, for the video. So you see this kind of video trying to pour water into a glass but missing so it spills next to it. This is definitely a different kind of video data set compared to things like, uh, I don't know, like UT YouTube uh, 8 million, which is just like random YouTube videos and labels based on their tags, or maybe like the UCF 101 action recognition data set. So it's an interesting data set, definitely a really interesting uh, result with respect to the uh, latency they achieve with this. So it's definitely interesting imagining it in devices like the Jetson Nano and the Jetson TX2 to have this kind of uh, edge device that is capable of this rapid video prediction. At the upcoming TensorFlow World event from October 28th to the 31st, NVIDIA will be presenting a series of talks about how TensorFlow 2.0 and TensorFlow RT are integrating with NVIDIA GPUs and a lot of NVIDIA software. So some of these uh, talks include things like just overall uh, the setting up of the TensorFlow on uh, NVIDIA GPUs, things like uh, quantization for TensorRT, a lot on TensorRT, which is the integration with TensorFlow 2 and this uh, inference accelerator optimizer for the NVIDIA GPUs and then a lot of other interesting talks presented at the uh, TensorFlow World Conference. Really exciting news in deep learning for medical imaging. Uh, Subtle Medical, a company out of NVIDIA's inception startup incubator, has received FDA clearance for its denoising MRI imaging software. So their network is a ResNet encoder decoder, which is able to improve the quality of these MRI scans. They built their model using the NVIDIA DGX workstation, and they have the uh, T4 for uh, inference. Talk about things like using the TensorRT with the CUDNN accelerated TensorFlow framework for further speed ups on the inference. And you can see kind of this idea of how the uh, subtle MR technology is enhancing or denoising the original MRI scans. So really interesting to see this kind of software uh, to improve the workflow for radiologists, get this FDA clearance to start to be uh, you know, implemented. One of the most exciting developments in AI recently is the advancement of RAPIDS, which is taking traditional uh, data science, things like the XGBoost algorithm, and you know, using these kinds of algorithms on tabular data sets. Usually these are enormous data sets in which you use things like Spark XGBoost in order to handle this kind of uh, distributed uh, data sets, these really complex and enormous data sets. So this article is detailing the performance boost achieved with the Rapid Spark XGBoost for Java and how it's able to speed up the algorithm, the XGBoost algorithm, and a lot of other details about this kind of uh, 
pipeline. Berkeley's AI research blog has posted an update to their Reinforcement Learning Library's Policy Builder API to make it a functional Reinforcement Learning Library, and then it can be compiled into Keras and TensorFlow Eager. So this is a really interesting idea. Uh, functional programming is this idea of you have a function, and if you give it the same input, it will return the same output every time. So this idea of having functional Reinforcement Learning to separate out the uh, policy, the loss, uh, the uh, you know actions and this kind of idea it really cleans up the code you can see in their article the difference between the legacy policy gradients and then the functional policy gradients aside from you know anything else you can just see the compression in the lines of code always a good thing and definitely interesting to see the development of this uh, reinforcement learning library maybe it'll make it easier for people to get started with reinforcement learning and have more of a standard interface. This week's edition of The Batch begins with a note from Andrew Ang reflecting on last week's note about uh, sort of irresponsible machine learning applications like the automatic comment generation that will you know, probably create tons of spam, things like deep fakes that have irritated people, and sort of just a consideration on is your machine learning project bringing others joy, is it doing good for the world? The first piece of news is this idea of autonomous drones and the Drone Racing League introducing this uh, racer AI autonomous flyer system powered by the NVIDIA Jetson AGX uh, Xavier inference engine. So the idea is to have autonomous drones racing for a $1 million prize. Really interesting. They've already started this racing. Uh, really cool autonomous uh, drone. Cause sort of like this training system could be deployed in different situations like uh, the Alphabet's Wing project, which is using uh, drone delivery systems. This kind of like uh, s training environment could also be useful to these kinds of tasks. Also in the batch is high accuracy, low compute. This is a really interesting idea of usually when we do uh, weight pruning on neural networks, we kind of go through the net network and we look at weights that are like uh, between a certain interval, say minus 0 0.1 to 0 0.1, and we would just prune them away, apply a mask to that, uh, you know, that weight matrix so you don't even bother with the uh, multiplication with those weights. But the idea in this paper is to, you know, save more computation by pruning out entire uh, convolutional filters as well. So rather than just pruning the weight, you prune out the entire filter that doesn't uh, have much of an impact on the outputs of the networks. And they find that this reduces the computational cost of an ImageNet ResNet by 55%, CIFAR ResNet by 70%, and then uh, you know small accuracy decrease in the ImageNet, and then it actually an increase in the CIFAR 10 uh, or CIFAR 100. Uh, prune model. The batch goes on to reflect on the clash of the frameworks between TensorFlow 2.0 and then the recently released PyTorch 1.3, reflecting also on the article published by The Gradient giving some more data into this uh, clash of the frameworks. So the interesting insight is that researchers are seeming to use PyTorch more and more, I'm mean, not seeming, but the data shows that they're using PyTorch more and more. The amount of PyTorch citations in research papers is going up like crazy, whereas it's decreasing for TensorFlow. However, with things like uh, LinkedIn listings and job postings, TensorFlow is still much higher than PyTorch popularity. So the analysis from the batch is suggesting that, you know, researchers are kind of dominating the deep learning space and it kind of starts from research and then propagates out into the application, the industry, so that they're suspecting PyTorch to be, uh, you know, more popular in the future. So also interestingly is the power of Babel, this idea of, you know, multilingual translation, similar to the uh, blog post we saw from Google's AI blog. There are all these languages and they need they don't have a lot of natural language processing tools. And also I thought a really interesting thing about this uh, note from the batch is this idea that a lot of these languages aren't like written down. So it's sort of so interesting to think of having these hybrid like ASR uh, neural machine translation systems that can work to help to uh, preserve these languages and translate them. Concluding with the batch is the uh, recent uh, success of abstractive summarization by breaking it down into extractive and then using the extractive summarization as a seed to the language models for abstractive summarization. So the idea is that abstractive summarization, contrarily to extractive summarization, means kind of summarize this in your own words compared to extractive, which is where you kind of just copy it from the text and try to preserve the most uh, you know, informative sentences in the original document. So this uh, research study is tested on archive papers, PubMed, Big Patent, Newsroom, and uh, you know evaluated with the rogue scores. The idea is that first you do extractive summarization and use this as a seed to something like a transformer GPT-like architecture. So you can also see interesting studies like OpenAI published recently, uh, fine-tuning GPT-2 with uh, reinforcement learning, where they also find on this uh, summarization task they have a big problem with uh, like copying when they try to. Uh, fine-tune it to human preferences. Thanks for watching the ninth edition of AI Weekly Update from Henry AI Labs. Please subscribe for more deep learning and AI videos.